All right, well, welcome to Steeples Church. I'm glad to have everybody in the room and everybody online. I know my father, so thank you for watching, Dad. <clears throat> we have a couple announcements. Uh, we will not be having potluck today, and that is because my father had knee surgery, and that's why he's doing well. Um, so be praying for him. He's doing well. Everything went well in the surgery. Now he just has to recover. He had a knee replacement. Um, we would like to ask you to pray for our Jewish friends as they celebrate Passover this coming week. We would pray that they would realize that the Passover lamb was Jesus Christ. Um, and we study every week. It's usually on Mondays, clock, uh, majority of the time. I think I've only had to switch it like three or four times in the last like eight months. It happened that two of them was very recent. Um, but you can always contact me or my father, and he will. we will send you a link, and we can add you to the text so you always know exactly when it's going to be. I, I text that you know, night. And, uh, get ready to communion to remember Jesus' sacrifice. It'll be quick this morning. It's going to be pretty quick. I'm ready to. I'm excited for today. Because I really like history, and I really like this, and the justice thing comes. So, Acts seven. Every day, this is talking about the church. Every day, they continue to meet together in the temple. Eight, glad heart, praising God flavor of the people. And the Lord heard the number daily that society west in its amount of that if the job church has in a the who say never share their faith because it's not their job was about point nine in 1993, 15% of Christians would never two of I wouldn't unless and so we need to that it's important to share our faith. Um, and if you look here, it says, and the Lord numbered daily those who were being saved. They were very passionate about showing love to others, about inviting them in their homes to meet Jesus, to sit and have them and show them love, to show them that they are truly worth something when this world tells you that we're not. If you're not rich, if you're not beautiful, you're not worth enough. And God says that we are the image bearers of God. We are worth it. Remember Jesus' sacrifice today to make us worth it, right? So we take the bread. Because Jesus believed that we were worthy enough to die for, right? It puts a lot of value on us. And you may take the cup. Father, thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the great amount of worth you put on every, no matter what they look like or sound like, where they were born. God, every person is a you. Thank you, God, sacrificing so forever. We pray the sermon would through me, God. That is insane. Us, to us, to you, God. We thank you for allowing us to be alive today, and we pray that. Your will be done in our lives and the lives of others. The lives are we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're going to start our sermon. Wife put dictator or king, but I a new title on the sermon just on Facebook because I thought the, the king thing, the one that you'll see. 
So, we're going to start out with North Korean father facts about them. So, North Korea are told. That's what they're told, okay? Kind of weird. Kim Jong-un was able to drive a car, and he was able to shoot a years at age three. Kim Jong-il shot a car, and he scored one. First, the and forever. The people yeah, are told that their leaders are worshipped worldwide and that every country, country celebrates both of them. Here's where it starts to get interesting. King was a, appeared in the sky, winter turned to spring. After Kim Jong il passed, individual day test with relations um, or if they thought they were here in they were subject to punishment even okay 15 100 days or is more strict but almost three year period morning on ill so after that three-year mourning period, Kim Jong-un construction meant to be built in every county in North Korea. 40 staff, 32 obelisks erected, and citizens are required to present holidays with them. It is difficult to get correct information in Korea. But made it that percent the budget is dedicated to keep and to keep Kim happy. Out of people, the leader of his budget on himself. Okay. We met King Ahasuerus, Persia, and he was better known by his Greek. Xerxes. Look up, like on Wikipedia or whatever. You can find King Ahasuerus, but it will King Xerxes or Artaxerxes. So he had a feast of 180. This is almost inconceivable. Last Averson make a single to basically. Having hundred unlimited, unlimited drink, feed of spending and trillions and whatever you want. You can see rich Xerxes. That's at the top of an across. Which is a heavy fortified palace, a man made hill rising 120 feet in the air. So, what does this tell Someone looking down, of course, upon the people, look at the mortals that he ruled. The same mood, every, every word, and worship. Right? Every deed designed to underscore like power and glory. He is concerned with his power and he, and he even has a law saying that drink is right, but the subtext is clear to everyone. In the regular my I am old, right? So what's happening in the in the, is that we introduce God and versus on this 
So through 12 is going to be where we're today. On the day when the heart of the king was with wine, he ordered Mehaemen, Bitzda, Harbona, Bigtha, Ab, Zethar, and Carcass. I apologize. I don't know. The in the presence of King Ahasuerus to bring Queen Vashti before her with her royal turban in order to display her beauty so that the people and the officials can see that how beautiful she is. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's order to be delivered by the eunuch. So the king became very angry and his wrath burned within him. Of a strange message. Okay, because if you think about it, this man believes himself to be a god. Not only says he's drunk, okay? We spent seven years being bring, but we all know that the eunuch on it. Why would he use? Well, deeper passage. Seventh day eunuchs went to get the king. Sorry, the queen. This also has two words in the original Hebrew. Times. Now, we do not have a number in English society. There's another culture today. Asian put very different, um, different us unlucky and six still Thus, we talk about it in a while. Um, but in Hebrew and Persian cultures, it meant much more than they do today. Okay, so the important. The more who occurrently the list eunuch, first set of two, and that we'll see in verse is the neat name. This is it's not thing. Two and four through the book twos is the number that will signify a contrast and a confirmation of something. Okay, the contrast of these seven units and the seven high nobles, the is contrasting. Their power, right? Because obviously the, the seven high nobles have a lot more power than the seven eunuchs. However, they both confirm the rule of the king. King Ahasuerus has rule over both. So, if you remember last week, we went over how massive the king's territory is. It goes from today's Greece to northern India. There is a reason why they mentioned the day eunuchs being seven. Why? We don't know, okay? Sometimes we don't know, but we know something is at play here, okay? I know some of you are thinking, why would he mention that if he doesn't know why? But just stay with me, okay? The queen is refusing King Ahasuerus, a drunk man who is known around his power. This is extreme executed for this alone, okay? So why would she do this? She has likely given her entire life to be with him. Her entire life she has spent getting ready to be his queen. So here is King Ahasuerus. He calls himself the conqueror of worlds, swallower of cities, high potentate of an unbreakable kingdom. At his words, laws are decreed, Enemies put to death, and friends are fabulously rewarded. His word goes out, and lo, it will not return void. So, why would she refuse him? If we look into this, we see that turban, or if it says crown in your translation, it literally means to surround. It's a, it's a circlet of some type. And it meant, is meant to highlight the beauty of the queen, right? So in this way, in the way that this reads, you know, Jewish people, 
especially back then, do not do, say things openly that would be considered inappropriate, okay? But the way the Jewish people would have understood it back then is that she was meant to only... Now it makes a little bit more sense, right? Queen Vashti was to come a lot of drunk men from a lot of different cultures to display her naked body. The second set of twos we see in this next verse is where it says, and his wrath is in him. This is the same thing we will see happen to Haman in the end. This contrasts them because Queen Vashti is a woman, Haman is a man, but also it confirms again the king's royal authority. One will lead a new life for the king, a Jewess, and the other will lead a second ruler for the kingdom, a Jew. So I'm going to read verses 13 through 22 outright. Okay, I know people don't usually do this, but we are commanded to read the Bible, so I'll read it. Stay with me. The king, then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was a king procedure towards all who were versed in law and judgment. The man next to him being, now there's seven names here. I'm not going to read them. The seven princes of Persia and Medina, Medea, who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. Ordinary, what is to be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus' deliverance by the eunuchs? Then Mechumen said in the presence of the kings and officials, not only against the queen, king has the queen Vashti done wrong, also against all the officials and all of the peoples who are the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt. Since they will say King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. Day, the noble women of Persia and Medea, who have heard that the queen's behavior will say the same to all the king of, king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. If it please the king, let the royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it will not be repealed, that Queen Vashti is to never again come before. Hazarus, and let the king give her royal give her royal position to another woman who is better than she is. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout the throughout all the kingdom, vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. This advice pleased the king and his princes, and the king did as Mechumen proposed. He sent letters provinces to every province and ripped every people in its own language that every man be master of their household and speak according to the language of his peoples okay have you ever heard of the story of samson it really is an incredible read if you haven't you should read it it's in judges 13 through 16 it is the closest story that we have in the Bible of someone being a superhero. He kills a lion with his bare hands. He destroys an entire army with the jawbone of a donkey. And he pulls down columns with his arms to kill his enemies. He was a Nazarite. And in ancient Israel, a Nazarite was someone who had a special relationship with God. It was almost more holy than everybody else. And there were certain requirements to be a Nazarite. One is that you never drink alcohol. And another is that you must never cut your hair. Okay? His strength comes from the relationship that he had with God. So throughout this story, you read he's very clever. He's very smart. He's obviously extremely strong. He kills a whole army alone. There is just one issue that comes along and... Her name is, she is being paid by the enemy armies 
find out where he gets his strength. Three separate times, she asks Samson where his strength comes from. And he lies to her three times. And if you read the book, it's, it's extremely frustrating because he will say something like, if you bound me with ropes, then I will lose my strength. And it, it reads as almost immediately someone comes in with ropes like that night and ties him up and she Samson, they're upon you. And then he breaks free and he kills the men. And then the next day she's talking to him and she's like, why have you lied to me? And it's like, he knows it's her who's betraying him. And yet he allows her to do it three times. And then in the end, he tells her the truth. So his, his, his strength comes from his relationship with God. And that relationship was, was seen physically by his hair. And when they come, they cut off his hair and they take him as a slave. And, and Delilah is paid her money. You're thinking the whole time, Samson, please, why are you not understanding this? You're smart. Why are you being tricked? Over and over, Samson doubles down on his foolishness. He was in love with Delilah. Okay? So the passage we just read is about a man who believes he is God, conveniently trashing his wife when she wouldn't at his altar with the necessary sacrifices, right? This is what culture looks like when it hasn't been leavened by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Men use and abuse women, reduce them to objects, and degrade them. It is inescapable. It is always what happens when a culture rebels against God. Our culture is like this, right? And it's rebellion against God Men have created a culture where they use women as sexual gratification, refuse to take any responsibility for cherishing her, where no covenant is required, and that may result from the sexual gratification can be conveniently discarded, right? And we have even managed to convince that these women, most of the women in my generation, that this is what it looks like for a culture to respect women, that they can be free with their bodies. We all know the statistics on um, inappropriate adult searching, that more searches are for that than any other search combined, that it makes more money than all the sports combined per year. It's, the numbers are staggering, really. All of this, from King Ahasuerus to us, is totally contrary to God's teaching. Men and women are image bearers of God. Men are not gods. We will never will be. Women are not their vassal slaves, and sex is not an at-will employment contract. Getting naked in front of men is not freeing yourself. So King Ahasuerus here refuses the invitation of grace, and he doubles down, doesn't he? He doubles down on his own arrogance. He punishes where he ought to repent. And then he passes a law that all wives must honor their men. Do we not see the irony here? He couldn't get a single woman to honor him because he's not an honorable man. And now he thinks he can decree that all women must obey all the men. And it's the same with North Korea. The leaders decree that everyone must worship them or face, execu or face execution. Fake gods can decree decrees, but their word will always return void in the end. When we read the Bible, you will find that history itself is always a struggle of kings. From Edom to Assyria to Babylonia, Persia to Greece to Rome, the true King Jesus and all the upstart rivals trying to unseat him. 
This is the story we are reading, King Jesus versus King Ahasuerus. How do the two compare? When Ahasuerus' kingdom saves, extorts, degrades, and shames, Christ's kingdom frees, enriches, cleanses, and exalts. Exalts. God, Jesus, he exalts us. What other kingdom does that? Not in, not in our kingdom. Not in our world. Where Hazarus throws a party in a desperate attempt to win respect and to bolster the glory of his throne, Jesus sets a table, a wedding feast, for those who worship he has already rightly secured. Where Hazarus abuses and uses and strips and degrades his bride, Christ washes, clothes, cleanses, adorns, nourishes, and cherishes his bride. That's, that picture is supposed to help us men understand how we are supposed to treat our wives. God's kingdom and her king stand utterly opposed to the Persian king and her king. Because unlike Persia's king, the king of God's kingdom is worthy of worship. Ahasuerus and all the imitations therefore and after are the same. We spoke last week about how God isn't named in the book of Esther. God is not inviting us to compare him to the rivals. Because God is in but we as humans, still try to compare, of course. And, and this is what God is really inviting us to do in this. Look at the behavior of this king, who really is, I mean, he's, he's one of the most powerful men in the world at this time, extremely wealthy. He can do whatever he wants, really. And yet, he is nothing compared to God. He is shameful. What hope do the people of God had when, it, when incompetent people sit on the of God's? Esther will teach us. We will wait and hope for the Lord to move. His timing is perfect. His wisdom is unrivaled and his power is limitless. Do not fear when the nations rage and people's plot against the Lord and his anointed. We will see by the end of this book that our Lord is no danger. And neither are we. Assimilate or imitate. One of our greatest temptations is to slowly conform to the patterns of this world. The Bible says that many times. And yet our calling is clear. Let's see. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brother and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We are not our own. We belong to God and purchase us with his perfect blood and now we are a city in a city, a kingdom in a kingdoms, and people for his own possession among the peoples. Don't assimilate or imitate the culture around you. Are we to uncritically embrace the decrees of our culture? No. Are we to bow at the, the altars that the altars that they worship at? No. At their cisterns, we should not go to find salvation, for God is living water. Rather, we pray, and how does Jesus tell us to pray? Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So that question we have, what ought we do when we are surrounded by people, we are amidst empires of people who believe to be God. They believe themselves to be gods. We are to live by faith, knowing that our king has a kingdom.
We are citizens there already, and we are to occupy this earthly city to show people who God is. That is why evangelism is so important. Maybe it's because I was raised in the evangelical church. I don't know, but it's, it's so foreign to me when I talk to people um, I, the other week, and he was saying that he used the Lord's name in vain for personal purposes. And he like wouldn't talk about his religion. And I'm almost certain he's Catholic. But um, it's like, why wouldn't... The Bible says over and over, share if you believe in hell... Why wouldn't you share with your family and friends? If you believe that's real, if it really penetrates your heart, you'd share with people. I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, especially if you're a very close, solitary person. I'm not saying go on a street corner and yell at people or even get in front of crowds, but talk to your family, talk to your friends, show love. That's what we're we're supposed to imitate. I think best ways in our culture because a lot of people have heard the gospel and have rejected it but if we show people in love if we show them that we're different that's what we do we belong as citizens even as we stand here occupying an earthly city we do not build bunkers to hide in we build churches to tell people of god so King Ahasuerus, all other kings, even the ones who are good, you know, they don't compare to God. God loves us. He has our best interests in mind, and he has the power to make those things happen, okay? So it really is true. A lot of people, um, if you look online or whatever, it says that only the weak would accept that God is real because they can't get through this life without believing that there's something after or maybe that God's real and he has the best for you. But if you do believe that God is real, the only logical decision you can make in obedience to him is to have full obedience to him, right? And of course, full obedience to God, we all strive for it. And while we don't at the same time, I mean, I don't want to get too far into sanctification and justification, but on this earth, we are striving to be obedient to God, and yet when we're sinners, we are totally not totally obedient to God. But God has our best interests in mind, like I said, and he can make those things happen. All right. Let us pray. God, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for our lives, God. Thank you for having our best interests in mind, being perfectly morally good, and being perfectly powerful so that you can make those things happen. We do have free will on this earth, and I pray that we would all follow your will. But for the people who don't know you or the people, you know, when we make mistakes, we pray, God, that we would know that you use everything for good. Everything happens for a reason, and maybe that reason is because we made a dumb decision. Just because everything happens for a reason doesn't mean that God forced it to happen. We can make these things happen, God, but you alone can bring good out of the bad situations, God, and we thank you for that. Father, we worship you because you were the only one worthy of worship. And when everybody is obsessed with the kings and the presidents or politics or whatever, God, and while it, it, it can be incredibly frustrating sometimes, we know that we can have hope in the end because we know that in the end, you win. While we will be frustrated in this life, we will not be frustrated in the next. Father, we thank you for everything you've done. We pray that this week that we would go out and show your love and evangelize by the way that we love other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so, so what, now what? That's what my dad says, right? And like I said, he isn't here because of his knee, but I believe, if we're lucky enough, he will be here next week. No?
Am I doing next week? Okay, I'm doing next week. I am doing. <laughs> so we did, we finished out chapter one of Esther. We will be starting chapter two. Obviously, I do not know what verse I'm going through yet. Um, we'll get there. I'll, I'll get something good. <laughs> All right. Well, if you have any questions, comments, my personal number, and I believe my father's personal number still is up on the Steeplest website and Facebook page. You can always contact us there too. Whatever. You know, just contact us if you have any questions, comments, anything like that. Thank you for being part of the Steeplers Church family. We love you, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>